howdy. Years ago, my publisher asked me to write a book about dysfunctional families, which seemed really weird since at that very same time, my family was going through some, well, craziness. And yet, he wants me to write a book that is going to help other people with their stuff. Well, despite the irony, I accepted the challenge, only to discover as I started doing my research, a huge slice of said <coughs> research came from me pulling on the branches of my own thoroughly screwed up family tree. <laughs> Part of that research included sitting down with a therapist, not for me, obviously, <laughs> but I was hoping that he would have something to say that could help me write my book. And boy, did he. In fact, one especially helpful item was a tool that family therapists often used called a genogram. It's basically a family tree on steroids, because in addition to names and dates and such, a genogram also tracks diseases, dysfunctions, and disorders. And then he urged me to write a genogram for my family. Oh, what a gut punch. On one branch of our family tree is a dad who sexually abused all three of his kids and physically abused his son as well. On another branch, leaf after leaf after leaf of alcohol and drug abuse accompanied by multiple DWIs, time spent in rehab and jail, arrests for public drunkenness and even uh, indecent exposure. On another branch is a nephew who lived in an open homosexual lifestyle back when doing that could get you killed. But Jeff made that move before others got the chance. Teenage pregnancy, check. Abortion, check, check. Porn addiction, check, 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 check. Chronic alcohol consumption, yeah, we got that too. And get this, another branch has logged an 85% divorce rate across three generations, which means most of that part of our family they have never known the security of an intact nuclear family. But it's not just the scandalous stuff. Our family also has known tragic stuff, a triple amputee, a kidney transplant, blindness, chronic depression, bipolar disease, panic disorders, multiple suicides. We have two Gold Star families. Down syndrome, obsessive compulsive d disorder. And I'm going to stop because, you know, I, I do have a sermon to preach. Um, <laughs> but I looked at all the squiggly lines and the notations in the margins, and there was hardly any white space left. And that's when I realized my family, the family that I deeply love, is one hot mess. And some of that mess is me. My genogram helped me as I wrote Stuck in a Small World. Uh, and, and what I saw as I did write was I needed to go back farther than the three generations that I knew about. I just had to find out, was there ever a time when doing family was not a hot mess? Not just my family. Has there ever been any family? Before I give you my findings, I figure some of you have already started your own genogram. Unless I miss my guess, it ain't pretty either. And if you haven't started yet, because you kind of like wagging your tongue and, and, and uh, your, fi well, let's see, wagging your finger and clucking your tongue, the other way around, it just doesn't work. Uh, at my family's screwiness, come on, big boy, just do it. And, and if your completed chart doesn't look an awful lot like mine, man, I don't even need to finish because it will. Just the fact that you don't want to do one tells me your clan puts the funk in dysfunction. <laughs> but before you die in a pile, check it out. Your messed up family is way more biblical than you might imagine. See, I took my generation all the way back to the very beginning, and I discovered that the human family has always been a train wreck with more twists than a Wetzel pretzel. 
for example, Earth's first family, Eve, tricked her husband into disobeying God's direct command. Then their older son killed their younger son because he thought God liked him better. Then Cain became the world's first runaway and the first face on a milk carton, I would imagine. The next major family was Noah's tribe. That family was saved from a global catastrophe. So how did Noah thank God? He got drunk and then he got naked. His son Ham saw that unseeable sight and blabbed it to the rest of the family. So Noah zapped a curse on him. I'm thinking Ham skipped Thanksgiving that year. The next prominent family is Abraham's family. And even though Abraham was called God's friend, and even though he was the father of all who believe, his family was also a fiasco. Dysfunction is found on every branch. For example, Abraham and Sarah couldn't conceive their own child, so Abraham makes Whoopi with a slave girl. And though it had been Sarah's idea, she gets so honked off, she kicks both Hagar and their illegitimate son, Ishmael, off the family plantation. Folks, we're barely out of the gate. And yet the human family genogram already includes murder, infidelity, drunkenness, stepkids, half-brothers, mistresses, parental neglect, plus verbal, if not also physical abuse. And no Dr. Phil around to say, how's that working out for you? (laughs) Not so well. Outcast Ishmael is now on the loose, living an angry life that led to an even angrier death. And his legacy of anger, folks, it's why the Middle East is on fire today. Then there's Abraham's other son, the favored son, Isaac, the son that God had promised. And yet you peek behind his tent flaps and there's even more of the same kind of pain. Isaac was 40 years old when he got married. He got married to a drop-dead gorgeous woman just like his mama. And then, just like mama, Rebecca couldn't have babies either. They wanted babies, they just couldn't make a baby. Thankfully, Isaac didn't repeat the sins of his father. Remember that Hagar fiasco, dad sleeping with another woman, making a baby with her instead of his wife, then bringing both of of, of her and her baby into the same tent where the real family lived? I'm shocked that didn't go well. But Isaac, facing that same problem, chooses not to do it the way Dad did. Instead of doing that plan, Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife. He didn't seek some substitute under the guise of helping God. He prayed, put his hand on wifey's belly and said, God, give us a baby. Folks, it's practically a proverb. Even if you were harmed by the foolish sins of your parents, chances are good you could wind up doing those same sins to your kids. Your mom got pregnant with you by her boyfriend. Your life was desperately hard because of it. And that there you go, doing the same thing. Your dad struggled with alcohol. On those rare occasions when he actually did come home, stuff got broken, people got hit, and not even your pillow could soak up all the tears. And yet now he is you. Just saying, although there are environmental factors as to why we behave the way we do, such as those who abuse likely were also abused, While environment may explain you, if explaining is all you care to do, your explanation is just an excuse. Thankfully, Isaac broke the family chain, refused to do it the way Daddy had done. You see, Daddy played, Isaac prayed, and the Lord answered his prayer. Rebecca got pregnant with twins that jostled each other one translation says they wrestled another says they kicked each other 
whatever was going on inside of Rebecca. I don't think it was fun for her. We know that because she prayed, Lord, why is this happening to me? I mean, I'm a first-time mama. Is this how this goes? God said, two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within you will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. In other words, that conflict, it's just getting started. Through Jacob will come the nation Israel, through Esau, the Edomites. Rebekah, this family feud has just begun. And sure enough, when time came to give birth, there were twin boys inside. The first to come out was red. His whole body was like a hairy garment. And so they named him Elmo, I mean um, Esau. And then little brother came out with his hand grasping Esau's heel. He was named Jacob, which means trickster. And as we shall see, his name fit. In verse 27, we find the first of two hints why this nuclear family went nuclear. Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the open country. I want you to picture a belly scratching, tobacco chewing, gun toting, F-350 lifted pickup driving man's man, a duck dynasty redneck, hairy chest, tatted arms, even hairier back, and an appetite for wild game that he grilled himself. Slay it, fillet it, buffet it. That was his life's motto. Meanwhile, Jacob is Esau's total opposite. He was a quiet man who was content to stay at home among the tents. He probably streamed HGTV, especially the cooking shows, because his favoritest thing ever was putzing around with Mama in the kitchen. Could any set of twins be any more different? Double-barreled Esau, if game was a moving, he was a shooting. Jacob matching spatulas in hand with an apron that read, forget Swifty, I love Chippy. <laughs> the second hint of a future family disaster is that Isaac loved Esau, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Ruh -ruh. See, Isaac saw himself in Esau, rugged outdoorsman, living off the land. And because Esau loved the same things daddy loved, there was affinity. And, and that's fine. But when affinity becomes favoritism, you've crossed a line. In fact, both parents crossed it. You see, Rebecca liked Jacob more probably because Isaac liked Esau more. Plus, Jacob liked putzing around the tent. Now, different doesn't mean that either was better than the other, but the spark that lit this family fire was when both Isaac and Rebekah picked sides. Parental favoritism is what blew this family to smithereens. Do you realize, parents, how selfish it is for you to expect your kids to be just like you? Because they're not. One comes out creative, the other aggressive. One is intelligent, the other athletic. Some kids are confident, others struggle with self-doubt. One is happy-go-lucky, the other introverted and unsure. You want him to play football. He prefers guitar. Mom loves crafting. Susie is a soccer machine. It's actually quite wonderful. God creates each little one to be his own unique self. But see, Jacob didn't take to the things that daddy loved, and so daddy lost interest. Same thing with Rebecca and Esau, and both boys were damaged because of it, but especially Esau who spent his whole life acting out because he never heard the words he desperately needed to hear. Here's why I say that. Once when Jacob, shock, was cooking stew, Esau, double shock, came in from the open, open country and was famished. Jacob, quick, let me have some of that red stew. 
what is it with this kid in red? Red hair, red complexion, red food? I'm starved, he said. First, sell me your birthright, said Jacob. What an operator. Always working the angles. Give me your birthright, and then you can have some. Now, Esau had no business even considering this deal. And yet, look, uh, I'm about to die here. What good is this birthright if I'm dead? He wasn't that hungry. Can we dial back the drama a bit, Esau? Besides, you like grilling. Cook your own grub. And if you need it fast, grab some goat jerky. Listen, teenage boys don't have discriminating palates. This is not a big deal. My son was a walking garbage disposal. <laughs> if it ain't nailed down, consider it down, right? Straight out of the can, straight from the jug, right out of the box. Help yourself, helpless. The stakes involved in this deal were so colossal, Esau should have just walked. See, back then, the family birthright was an amazing privilege reserved for the oldest male child. If you received the family birthright, listen to this, you would get two times the inheritance of the other kids. You alone would carry the family name and become the patriarch when daddy died. And just before daddy did die, he would leave you a specific or a very special prophetic promise not just a hopeful wish, but, but something inspired. And because this particular family was waiting for the Messiah, the birthright also meant that your name would be included in the ancestral lineage of the promised one. And yet Esau is about to trade all of that for a bowl of soup. Now Jacob's clearly playing to his name. Takes his impulsive big brother to the cleaner's now, this was totally unnecessary on Jacob's part because God had already promised, remember, the older serving the younger? God had already promised, Jacob, you're going to get the birthright. So why is he being a jerk? Swear to me first, he says. So Esau swore an oath selling his birthright. What a meathead. Trading away millions of shekels plus land, the family name, and the bloodline of Messiah for soup. Although Jacob also tossed in some bread, so there's that. So Esau ate and drank, having despised his birthright. At the moment, I care nothing about stupid birthrights. Besides, we don't even know if Messiah is coming. But, but what do I do? I mean, what I know now is I am hungry, so soup, get in my belly. Some say Jacob deceived his brother, but this part of the story is not deception. Esau just cut a bad deal. The deception comes next. Yeah, this deal was a crock. Get it? Okay. But Esau knew the score. Jacob was a jerk. But the takeaway of this story, hear me, is, is that Esau recklessly despised God's eternally significant blessing just to satisfy the fleeting physical impulse. Make note of that, men. Sound like anybody you know? He traded his birthright for his belly. That's why Hebrews 12, 16 calls him profane. So chapter 25 is about the birthright. Chapter 27 is about the blessing. When Isaac, the boy's daddy, was old and his eyes so weak he couldn't see, he called for Esau, his older and favorite son. Here I am, said Esau. Isaac said, I'm an old man. I don't know the day of my death. Now we do. Turns out Isaac would live another 80 years. But see, once parts start breaking down, you start wondering, right? So Isaac says, get your quiver and bow and go hunt some wild game. Prepare me some tasty food and bring it to me so I may give you my blessing before I die. Now remember, the blessing wasn't wishful thinking. It was a prophetic announcement, a, a God-inspired look into the future. 
But the reality is, God had already clearly promised that Jacob would get the blessing. Besides, hadn't Esau already squandered the birthright? See, the birthright and the blessing are linked, two sides of the same coin, really. And so when Esau swore the oath, he didn't just give away the birthright, he gave away the blessing as well. And both dad and son knew that, which means both dad and son are now co-conspirators against God. How do I know that? Because the blessing was always to be this huge family celebration, kind of like a wedding in our day, and said they're sneaking around at night planning a secret ceremony. He's sending his number one on a secret hunt. Isaac setting into motion this, this scheme, a scheme that would forever divide, deceive, and destroy his family. But get this. Meanwhile, Rebecca was listening as Isaac spoke to his son Esau. Well, of course she was. Dad's pulling his stunt, and Mom is listening on the other side of the tent flap, probably recording the whole thing on her iPhone minus XVXXLIMOP. So if Jacob had his issues, which he did, wonder why wonder why so when Esau left to hunt Rebecca said to her son Jacob did you catch that Isaac spoke to his son then Rebecca said to her son these people didn't even try to hide it I overheard your father say to your brother bring me some game and prepare me food that I may give you my blessing before I die Baby, your daddy's trying to give to Esau what God said belonged to you. So listen carefully and do what I tell you. Say, what? Jacob is in his mid-40s, and yet mama says, do what I tell you? When I was a kid, I had frequent and painful interactions with <clears throat> corporal punishment. My dad used practically lethal, in these days, illegal methods, whereas my mom would reach for one of these. <laughs> Remember those? To me, it was a conspiracy, because that ball and that flimsy rubber string would break within an hour of using it. So I lost a toy, but mom gained a weapon. And that paddle worked when I was five. But when she came after me when I was 13, and she took the biggest old swing she could, I shouldn't have, but I did. I laughed. So she kept hammering on me. I kept laughing. Because there comes a time when parental tactics, they got to change. Do what I tell you? Are you serious? But since Jacob had never had a healthy bond with his dad, mama's all he's got. So to maintain standing in the home, he had to keep the only decent relationship he had somewhat intact. Therefore, I can't say no to mama. Still, he had to wonder, mama, if God promised the birthright to me, why do we got to pull these crazy stunts? Why don't we just, I don't know, let... Let God work it out. But even if he did think it, Adam was like Adam Sandler in The Water Boy. Mama said, my mama said, Esau's the devil. Well, mama also said, go out to the fly. I mean, you don't hunt, so go to the freezer. Bring me two choice goats so I can prepare tasty food for your father just the way he likes it. Then take it to him that he may give you his blessing. Jacob's not so sure about this. Mama, my brother is hairy like Chewbacca. But I got smooth porcelain skin. I never leave the tent without SPF 4000 slathered all over my pastiness. So, so Mama, what if Father touches me? 
I would appear to be tricking him. Huh? Did he say appear? <laughs> of course he was tricking him. And bring a curse rather than a blessing. Now when Jacob acknowledges that the plan is kind of sketchy and what will happen if I get caught, understand, he was not repenting, just confessing. He knows what he's about to do is disgusting. So, Jake, you going to stop it? Well, I didn't say that. Still going to do it, just worried about the repercussions. And that's the difference between confession and repentance. When you confess a sin that you still plan to do, all you're saying is, I hope I don't get caught. Whereas repentance admits that what I want to do is wrong, so I'm going to stop, drop, and stroll the other direction, getting out of here. Instead of living for my own desires, I'm going to live for the Lord. But you see, Jacob's solution to avoiding the consequences was to just be even more sneaky. My mama, is there anything we can do to sin better? My mama said, well, let the curse fall on me to begin with, okay? Just do as I say. Don't bother with what God has said. Do what my mama said. And if that little pansy didn't do it, he brought the food to mama. She prepared it just the way dad liked it. I mean, they're tricking a blind man, folks. So she took Esau's best clothes, put them on Jacob. Wait a minute. He's in his 40s, and Mama is still dressing him? We got more problems than pasty skin. She also covered his hands and the smooth of his neck with the goat skins. Big brother must have been one hairy dude. Years ago, I was in Dallas. I was on a book tour, and I had a free evening, so I went to a Mavericks game. During halftime, they, seriously, they had a hairiest man contest. I've searched the web. They've cleaned it, okay? But they had top, uh, 10 finalists march out topless to midcourt amid a chorus of oohs and groans. It was awesome. The entire arena <laughs> voted. Whoever got the most noise won. And this is really close, really close to what the winner looked like. I mean, forget shaving that back. You'd have to take a weed whacker to that. After he won, the winner ran up to a cheerleader for a hug. That wasn't happening. His grand prize, get this, free laser sessions. <laughs> so that's Esau. So hairy, mama had to glue a goat to Jacob's back. She handed Jacob the tasty food and the bread that she had made. Jacob goes into the tent and says, My father, yes, my son, who is it? I am, I am Esau, your firstborn. So add to the deception an outright lie. I've done as you told me, lie number two. Sit up and eat some of my game, lie number three, so that you may give me your blessing. Well, Esau was blind, but he wasn't dumb. How'd you find it so quickly? The Lord gave me success, Jacob replied. So now we've stumbled into blasphemy. Praise God, Daddy, I didn't have to climb a deer stand or spray urine on my boots. I just stood there and, thank you, Jesus, meat. Have you ever sinned and then justified that sin because, you know, it worked. God was in this, Daddy. Everything worked like a charm. Isaac said, come near so I can touch you just to know whether you're really Esau. Jacob went close. Daddy touched him and said, the voice is the voice of Jacob, but these hands are definitely Esau. And because he didn't recognize Jacob, Isaac blessed him. In other words, it worked. Are you really my son Esau? I am, Jacob replied. Then bring me game to eat so I may give you my blessing. Jacob brought it. Daddy ate it. Then Isaac said, come here, son, and kiss me, which he did. 
And when Isaac caught the smell of his clothes, he blessed him, saying, Oh, the smell of my son is like the smell of a field the Lord is blessed. May God, here's the blessing, give you of heaven's dew and an abundance of grain and new wine. May nations serve you and peoples bow down to you. Be Lord over your brothers, and may those who curse you be cursed, and those who bless you be blessed. Again, not wishful thinking. It's a prophetic promise. Isaac thinks he's given it to Esau, which would have been a sin if he had, but Jacob just tricked his dad into giving him the blessing that God had already promised was going to happen. Whew. So what twisted thing could possibly happen next? Well, Esau comes back from his tent he brings the grub to Isaac. Daddy realizes he's been duped and trembles violently. I'd call it a panic attack. And when Esau realizes the blessing that was his had gone to Jacob instead, he burst out with a loud, bitter cry, Daddy, bless me too. Sorry, son, only one blessing per family. And the one went to Jacob. Esau said, isn't he rightly named Jacob Trickster? This is the second time he's taken advantage. He took my birthright, and now my blessing. And he's right. Jacob was a snake. But he didn't deceive Esau the first time. Just a bad deal. This time it was deception. But wasn't deception what Esau was always plan also planning to do? by secretly stealing what God had promised to Jacob. Have you ever tried to reinterpret past events by retelling the story so that you appear as the only victim? That's Esau. Jacob did this to me. No, you were severely stupid. You should never have attempted that stunt, but you did, and now you're blaming him for besting you? Grow up, hairy man. Esau caused the problem. Had he never traded the birthright, he might never have lost the blessing, but he did. He did. And though he had no one to blame but himself, Esau held a grudge against Jacob for the rest of his life, and this broken family never did heal. Great story, Wyatt. What are we supposed to do with it? Is there anything here that we can pull out to help us? Yeah, we could talk about family relationships. We could dive into parental favoritism or sibling rivalry. Um, we could do that. Uh, we're not going to do that. We could also talk about the family blessing, one of my favorite topics to talk about. But all of that is sidebar to the main thrust of the Genesis story. What is the main thrust? I hope you're wondering. A longtime missionary to China, J. Hudson Taylor, once said, Christ is either Lord of all or he is not Lord at all. And I must agree, you have either fully submitted to Jesus Christ or you haven't bowed the knee to him at all. To say that Jesus is Lord is to acknowledge that he's the boss and you're not the boss, which means he alone is in control and you aren't in control. Our Lord Jesus Christ demands to have supremacy, you see it, in everything. And not just some things. You see, you and I tend to try to compartmentalize Jesus' lordship. So that as long as I declare Jesus is Lord with my mouth, it's all good. Even if there is slippage in how I put his lordship into practice with the rest of my body. But if Jesus is to have supremacy in how many things? All things, everything, anything. We come back to Taylor. If Jesus isn't Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. Yeah, but Wyatt, 
uh, most everything else in my life is in alignment, just this one thing, just one little exception, okay? Maybe I do overdo it with alcohol, or maybe I'm toying around with certain chemicals. Maybe I'm having an affair, or, or I'm doing porn, or I'm flirting at the bar, but just because I lie to my wife and ignore my kids doesn't mean Jesus isn't my Lord. When you compartmentalize the lordship of Jesus in your life that behavior leads to duplicity and what that means is you have a distracted divided mind and Jesus said nobody can serve two masters and here's why because a duplicitous and a divided life it always seeps there's always leakage and once a leak begins to seep, it is hard to get that leak back in the bottle. Thinking that you can make Jesus Lord of some parts of your life, but not all, that's dangerous, and it just never works. After the Super Bowl on Sunday, it was heartening to hear both quarterbacks openly profess their faith in Christ. And yet I got to admit, I kind of struggled because one of those young men uses that same mouth to routinely drop F-bombs as often as it, and as emphatically as his linemen. I'm not, say, I'm not a prude. I'm not saying the F-bomb is an unforgivable sin. In fact, I'm not going to say anything at all. But here's what the Bible says. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers, this ought not be. Some call such behavior soft commitment. Hudson Taylor says it's a lordship problem. The Apostle Paul says that Christ does not have supremacy. That's a deal, folks. So as you chew on that, let's hustle one more time back to Jacob. This man has spent his entire life living on the ragged edge. Never was there a time when Jacob wasn't double dealing and scamming and being sneaky and deceptive. He was the ultimate con man, a flim flam, a disingenuous, dishonest, devious fraud. He taped goat parts to his neck. And Esau watched it happen and he never forgot. In chapter 8, that bitter root in Esau is about to cause a whole world of trouble. What kind of trouble? Esau said, the days of mourning for my father are near, and now I'm going to kill my brother. And that's when Jacob and his father finally agree on something. Jacob needs to get out of Dodge. So Jacob left Beersheba, set out for Haran, and when he reached a certain place... I love this, a place so remote they didn't even bother to name it, although someone did write a song. He went through the desert to a place with no name. And, and that's all I'll do. Um, but this certain place is a reminder that how far Jacob had fallen. He went to nowhere. He stopped for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones there, he put it under his head and lay down to sleep. I mean, your life has hit bottom when you're using rocks for pillows. But somehow, he got a little sleep. In fact, he had a dream, a very famous dream, where God repeats the promise he first gave to Jacob's grandfather Abraham, a promise given in spite of Jacob's horrific duplicity. Listen to this. I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. I will still give you and your descendants the land on which you lie. Your descendants will still be like the dust of the earth, and you will still spread out to the west, the east, the north, and the south. All peoples on earth will still be blessed through you and your offspring. I am still with you. I will still watch over you. I will still bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I promised you. Wow. So Jacob awakens. Man, this place is awesome. 
And so he plants a rock there, renames the place Bethel, which means the house of God. These events are given to us, folks, as a reminder that even when we are faithless, he's faithful. Now, I want you to take a look at this map, and I realize you're probably not going to be able to read the words, but I want to show you what's happening here geographically. Jacob receives this promise. Remember, he's down here in Bethel, right there. Jacob receives the promise. He returns to God a promise of his own. He says, if God will be with me and watch over me on this journey I'm taking so that I return safely to my father's house, then the Lord will be my God and this stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house. Now follow me again. He's down here in Bethel, right? Southwest corner. I realize you can't read it, but you can follow the green dot, all right? This Bethel, not at all far, that's Gaza right there where the world is on fire. His destination, as we just read, is to leave Bethel, go all the way up here. That's Haran, the extreme northeast corner. Now, Bethel is where these huge outsized promises were just exchanged. God said, if you go, I'll bring you back. Jacob says, when I go, I will come back. I don't know if they shake on it, but that's the deal. So Jacob goes to Haran. 20 years later, he does come back with wives and kiddos, but even with all the bathroom breaks, he finally makes his way back. Just like God said, if you go, I'll bring you back. Jacob also said, when I go, I will come back. Except, not exactly. Not exactly. He intended to. Jacob had planned all along to return to Bethel, but things come up, right? So after Jacob came from Paddan Aram, which is where Haran is, he arrived safely at Shechem. Can we go back to the big map real quick? Okay. He came back, and he arrived at Shechem. Shechem. Wasn't he going to Bethel? And he didn't just stop there to camp out. He bought a plot of land. He pitched his tent, and he set up an altar and called it El Eloe Israel. You see where Shechem is? Look at this. There's Shechem. Jacob had traveled all the way to Haran and all the way back from Haran according to their vow one to the other. He's coming all the way back to Bethel, just like God said, just like Jacob said, but he stops at Shechem. Shechem isn't Bethel. Shechem is 20 miles short of Bethel. This man obediently went all the way to Haran. But on his way back, he stopped 20 miles short. <laughs> God had said, come back to Bethel. Jacob said, I'm coming back to Bethel. But he stops in Shechem. Jacob did what he always had done, took a shortcut. Before it was fake hair, but God still blessed him tried to lower his voice. God was still with him. He always lived on the edge of obedience. It always seemed to work out. He had good intentions, but he never did as he intended. And I'm sure he thought, no harm, no foul. I mean, in spite of all my shenanigans, God always keeps his promise, right? No, I didn't go exactly where I said I'd go, but I guess I, I don't know. I think I got close enough. It's not like I wandered clear off the map. I got within 20 miles. That's a general vicinity, Shechem, instead of Bethel. Not a big deal. Listen to me. That thought process is what most pleases the adversary. The thought that God is okay with you as long as you are in the general vicinity of where he wants you to be. After all, I'm only compromising this. 
It's not like I've gone off the deep end. Just, just this, not everything, just this. Satan's stated mission is to steal, kill, and destroy you. Do you understand? But his first tactic in doing that is never to send you off the deep end so that you no longer believe in God, you hate the church, you renounce the faith. No, Satan's ultimate strategy is to get you to stop this short. Because if he can get you to stop a little short this time, it'll be even shorter next time. Now, the good news is Jacob eventually figured it out, but not, as we'll find out next time, not before his daughter was raped, his sons were murderers, and the family wealth was taken. Any guess where that happened? Shechem. It all happened because Jacob stopped just 20 miles short. Let's bow. As we prepare for the Lord's Supper, the burning question I want you to ask of yourself is this. Where am I stopping short? Because you see, it's in the small things. Things that we think aren't a big deal at all. It's exactly what Jacob thought too. He had no idea what his decisions would cost him. And not only him, all because he stopped 20 miles short. Child of God, I truly hope that you are awake enough that you realize just what time it is. See, I believe the time is short. I believe the coming of our Lord is truly at hand. Meanwhile, our whole world is at a tipping point, and it seems as though either something catastrophic or something glorious is about to happen. And while I have no inside information, I believe, because Jesus himself said it, that the time really is at hand. I also believe that our righteous judge is standing at the door. So if that's true, wouldn't you rather Jesus find you right in the center of his will than to be found living just 20 miles short of where he wants you to be?